It's looking like it's four o'clock. We'll give it another about two minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll let people, uh, we'll start the conversation. Renata. Give it one more minute. Thanks everybody for your patience. Looks like people are still trickling in. Okay, I think, uh, I think it looks like a good time to get started. So welcome everyone to this Women in Medicine Summit webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Um, our goal today is to uh, talk about the challenging time that we're in right now. And we have some amazing speakers to talk about leading in a crisis. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of housekeeping tips just so you know how to navigate the Zoom uh, meeting today. So first of all, thank you for joining us for Leading in Crisis, a fireside chat. This conference is being presented by the Women in Medicine Summit, and we are really excited to be able to bring this content to you virtually in this extraordinary time that we are currently living through. Um, so this conference is being recorded and we'll be able to share a link with all of you after the event is complete. Um, we welcome you to revisit the content as often as needed. I'm sure it will be full of very important and necessary pearls for the future. We also invite your comments and your questions. We have a Q&A box that we would love for you to enter questions in during the entire webinar. Um, at the end of the session, we'll have some time to get to as many questions as possible. Um, just type it in there as we're going through. And if you want to chat amongst the audience, we're happy to let you chat in the chat box feature. We will have all of the participants muted other than the speakers to prevent uh, background noise. Um, and we also will have the opportunity to have a couple of uh, poll questions. So if you could please answer those as well throughout the, the webinar. Um, one exciting feature you will notice if you see on the side box, we have Lauren Green from Dancing with Markers. She will be live animating the, uh, the entire webinar. Uh, her work has been featured on our website and has been published in the International Journal of Academic Medicine along with the summit last year. So um, each of you will also have access to the beautiful artwork that comes out of today's uh, webinar. So... Without further ado, I would like to introduce the moderator of our fireside chat today, Lori Betke. So Lori is the assistant chair of the Women in Medicine Summit He for She track this year. She is also a faculty member and director of healthcare leadership programs at Creighton University. Lori is a very sought after speaker and author with broad experience building companies and leading organizational change. She has a specific expertise in healthcare management, emotional intelligence, and strengths-based leadership. 
She is an active mentor and an advisor to senior executives, physician leaders, and entrepreneurs. Lori has a bachelor's degree in human services and business administration and a master's degree in healthcare administration. At the age of 26, she became the youngest individual to achieve board certification as a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. And she is also board certified as a fellow of the American College of Medical Practice Executives. She's been certified by the Gallup organization as a strengths performance coach since 2006. She is a recipient of many, many awards and holds a faculty appointment at Crichton University's Hyder School College of Business, where she serves as director of the Executive MBA in Healthcare Management Programs. Her first book titled The Emerging Healthcare Leader, A Field Guide, was published by ACHE's Health Administration Press in 2015. And she's also contributed chapters to many other very, very well-recognized and nationally and world-renowned books. Um, Lori is also a personal friend. She has spoken at the summit. She spoke at the summit last year. She is speaking again this year, and she is a thought leader in every sense of the word, and I am honored to know her and to have her as our moderator today for this amazing fireside chat. So with no further ado, I will hand the webinar over to Lori. Well, thank you very much, Shika, and uh, it's a pleasure to have everyone join us today. This is a really, really important topic, and I'm excited to be able to have two really terrific thought leaders joining us today to really talk about leading through crisis. We have been in some very tumultuous months, and as we can all very well see, whereas we might have thought that we were through the thick of it by now, we're most definitely not. And um, I certainly did not get any specific training on crisis management in any of my academic background. And I'm guessing the majority of you would agree that that is your reality as well. So um, I'm looking forward to introducing our two panelists. Uh, but first, I want to take a quick moment um, to offer you the opportunity to take a polling question uh, we have, I think, two or three throughout, but um, Polly, are you going to queue that up or would you like me to introduce the first polling question? Thank you everyone for registering your votes. If you haven't yet, please see that polling question on the screen. And we're looking at answers come in. It looks like pretty clearly um, a strong majority of us don't feel prepared to lead in a crisis. And like I said, I don't know that we, uh, very many of us, feel like we get good training in our academic programs. And it's an important topic to talk about because when that crisis presents, it's incredibly important that we can rise to the challenge. So um, I don't want to take up any more of the time of our two presenters. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Mark Hurtling and Dr. Omira Mansfield uh, by way of brief overview. And I'll let them uh, give you just a little bit more introduction to them, but I'll tell you that Dr. Mark Hurtling is a retired Lieutenant General in the US Army. He's a current National Security Analyst uh, for CNN and has spent a number of years now in his retirement uh, leading leadership development programs at Advent Health in Florida, uh, where he is colleagues with Dr. Omira Mansfield, who is the Chief Medical Officer of two locations within the Advent Health System in Opapka and Winter Garden. So these two leaders are incredibly well trained and have a lot of expertise and good counsel to bring us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and bring up your slide deck and just let you go ahead and talk back and forth through the conversation of what brings you to this topic today. I'm gonna to share my screen now. And encourage you to go ahead and Start talking us through this topic, um, leading in crisis and, and specifically COVID-19. Take it away. Well, thanks, Lori, and, and thanks, Chica, also for inviting uh, Dr. Mansfield. And I, I think I ought to 
give the caveat that I am not a medical doctor. Uh, I just recently received a doctor in business administration, but the, the thing I studied during that time was physician leadership. Uh, and it grew out of uh, what I've been doing since I retired in 2013 from the military, and that's working with Advent Health and a lot of great doctors like uh, Omira Mansfield and others, and we'll talk about that. But this all came about, uh, this specific topic, and Omira and I have had some unique opportunities to discuss what we have done together in, in various uh, forum. And, and I think you'll find it interesting only because it's the way that we exchange information. Uh, I'll lead off by saying that Omira was in the second class of a physician leadership course that we started here at Advent Health that I was asked to design and execute. And I met Omira and, and we became very good friends and had quite a few conversations. And I feel like um, she's chosen me for a mentor. Uh, why, I don't know, but it's been kind of fun working with her. Um, she called me uh, way back in March when things were first starting to heat up a little bit with the crisis and asked some questions about uh, how do you take the leadership lessons that we learned in, in the seminars that we formed and, and exchanged ideas in and apply them to a crisis situation. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second, but the last thing she said to me was, could you take the top 10 things uh, that you experienced in combat as a soldier and apply them to what we're going through in healthcare with this enemy pandemic. So it was uh, just a really provocative conversation that caused both of us to start thinking a little bit. And I gave some advice to Omira, which is part of, of this uh, particular slideshow. But what I wanna do first is talk very briefly about leadership. And uh, as Evan Health asked me to put together this class that we now teach uh, on a yearly basis to about 50 doctors, uh, nurses, and administrators, um, they asked me to take some of my learnings from the military and apply them to healthcare. Well, the theory and practice of leadership really centers around three things. To be a good leader, you have to have certain attributes or behaviors. You have to uh, be able to exhibit certain competencies, and then you have to learn a, a myriad influence techniques uh, to inspire and influence people to do what you're asking them to do as a leader. So that, that's the centerpiece of the eight month course that we do is discussing those kind of things. If you could flip to the next slide, uh, Lori. Um, this is an army model and I'm very openly telling everyone that I've plagiarized it from a doctrinal manual that we have. Uh, so the first two elements of that leadership model that I talked about are the attributes and competencies. We do a great deal of work in our seminars about what kind of person are you and how do others see you, see you which really form character and presence. And then what do you know and how do you see the world? That's your intellect. And it, it, it encompasses a whole bunch of things. I was just at a, a webinar with Lori about a week ago where she talked a lot about emotional intelligence. Well, emotional intelligence is part of that knowing part of the be, no do model. And then certainly the competencies of any leader, you have to build trust, you have to know how to build teams. And then the most important thing is you have to understand how to make things happen. So those are the first two things. Uh, next slide, Lori. When you break those down even further, um, this is how we expand that model in various aspects within the course, the seminar that I teach uh, to all the, the medical professionals here. So those are some additional attributes of character presence and intellect. Next, next build there, Lori. And then here are the, uh, elements, the competency elements of lead, develop, and achieve. And we can certainly make these slides available to anybody that wants them, but it's really the discussion of these various things that allow individuals to do a deep dive into their leadership capabilities. Then the last thing we really talk about in terms of a model, next slide, uh, Lori, is influence techniques. How do you take motivation of other individuals 
uh, and apply that to the task at hand using various inspirational or influence techniques. Uh, all three of those things are critical for building leaders. Uh, these, these are really the things we discuss in great detail in these seminars that we do over an eight month period of time. Uh, I think it's made a difference in our culture. It started, as I said, back in 2013, we had our first class, ne next slide, Lori, and here's a picture of the graduates of the first class. Uh, I, I don't want to insult Amira, she was not in that first class, she was in the second one. But what's interesting is when I look at, these, at this picture today, it's fascinating that this took place, they, these individuals all graduated in 2014 uh, you can't tell because they're all wearing lab coats, but it, in this class were 35 doctors of all specialties, 10 nurses, and five hospital administrators from the 11 different campuses we have in Orlando. And that's what the medical profession calls an interprofessional team. We didn't know it at the time, uh, but we were one of two hospitals in the country that do leadership development in this interprofessional method by having people come together. Now, these individuals in a normal situation, uh, it, we've, we've had metrics and research that shows they improve their communication, they improve their information exchange, they have a better understanding of both their own personal values and the organizational values. They understand better how to work as part of a, uh, an organization that's trying to build a healthcare culture within an organization. But really what we were talking about during those seminars was how do you apply leadership when it's business as usual? In other words, normal operations. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, all, all hospitals have, have facets of emergency room. Omira is a ED doc, so she's gonna talk about that. But most people just come into work every day and do what they need to do in healthcare. Uh, there are some, certainly some times when things get crazy. Uh, in a hospital in Florida, as you can imagine, we have emergencies probably a couple of times a year when the hurricanes are approaching and we have to treat a lot of people and take care of the community. But when you take it outside the normal mode of operation and get into a crisis, like all of us have seen during this pandemic, then things start to change. Next slide, please, Lori. So here are some things when Omira and I were talking, and I, I not only talked to her, but also talked to another physician by the name of Dr. Scott Brady, who uh, is running our pandemic crisis response team, as well as some of our administrators. And I said, here are some things that are different. You know, in a crisis, decision-making is different. It's, it's right now. There isn't the ability to wait till later and you can't have all the information you need in order to make that decision. Uh, so that, that first bullet up there is the dynamics of decision-making change completely when you move from normal operations day-to-day -to, -day to a crisis situation where things are really being put on your shoulders and you're being asked to do multiple things at once. Um, in the second bullet, what I suggested to our team is there's a difference between fighting for intelligence which all soldiers are asked to do versus gathering information. For the most part, doctors as scientists, physicians as scientists, gather information. When they have a tough case, they hit the books, they look at their medical journals, they say, how is this case with this individual patient different from the last, and every case is different, and I know that, I've learned that since I've been in healthcare. But when you're talking about something that the organization is defending, and that is the community health, then you really have to seek intelligence. And as we see on the news every day, there's more and more breakthroughs uh, in terms of giving us more knowledge on what this pandemic is all about. And if you read a great book like the, the Influenza, The Great Influenza uh, by John Berry, you'll see that even back in 1919, when the first flu pandemic hit, that it was a continual search for new intelligence and they had to reach out and do some things that were very different from just collecting information. So just being aware of that is critically important. The third bullet, prioritizing expertise. You know, in, in most of our hospitals, 
when you take a look at our marketing directors and the people who have the front with the communities, it's part of the public relations team or the marketing team. But when you're talking about, uh, I'm sorry, if you can go back, when you're talking about a crisis situation, you put the experts out front. And one of the conversations we had at, at Advent Health was, who are the experts? And immediately it's the normal spokespeople that say, well, we know how to talk to the press or we know how to talk to the government. But truthfully, in a, in a crisis, they don't have the expertise to really deal with the disease and understand what's going on. So there's a requirement to quickly train physicians to be that person at the forefront. Elmira has done a magnificent job of that. Uh, others have as well. The, the infectious disease doctor, Dr. Sue, in our organization has found that it's a whole lot different talking to the community and helping them understand his language than it is talking to other physicians to get them to understand what's going on. So all that's part of a crisis response. Uh, the fourth bullet in terms of bringing teams together, doctors, nurses, administrators, government, uh, insurance companies, the patient, uh, the patient's family, all of, that, the, all of that takes on a whole new meaning when you're dealing in a crisis. Uh, and, and truthfully, there's a whole lot of research that says doctors and nurses sometimes don't get along all that well. And certainly doctors and administrators sometimes don't have the trust they need. And certainly doctors and government officials don't want anything to do with e each other. And I can certainly understand that having been in the military for a long time. But unfortunately, you have to help them understand the crisis in order to get them to establish policy methods for the communities that will best help your, your organization. So not only the requirement for an interprofessional team, people from different diverse cultures need to come together, but there's even a requirement to build those teams on the fly and get information out because information in a crisis is the coin of the realm. Uh, the next bullet, the need for strategic vision and campaign phasing. This is something we talked about uh, with our pandemic response cell, that physicians are normally used to coming into work and addressing issues as they arise. But when you're talking about something as, as unique and as complex as this crisis, the phasing of the campaign, to use military language, and the understanding that you have to take a strategic view versus a tactical view of day-to-day -day operations becomes more important. And that's a cultural shift for most physicians who are used to dealing with the patient today versus what might happen to the patient in the long time. Uh, the, the next to last bullet, the communication piece. And this is where something that, that I think uh, our organization has excelled, and I put it directly on the back of, of all the physicians who have done great work, but in seeing how leadership is really partly understanding how you communicate to others and understand their motivations uh, has helped people to say, hey, I, get, I just can't talk in my language. I have to understand what the person's language is I'm talking to. And my uh, speaking is just as important as my listening to them, as well as my body language, facial expression, tone of voice, techniques, methods, and timing of that uh, communication. So, so communication is an important requirement for all leaders. It becomes increasingly important in a crisis because you have to hold people, and this gets to the last bullet, responsible and accountable for the things that they need to do. Next slide. This, this is probably, this next slide is what Omira and I will probably talk about. And this was the, the top 10 list uh, that came out based on Myra's request for me. And I won't go into this more than just let you see what these are. We can maybe come back to this later on. But I know uh, Dr. Mansfield and, and other physicians have, have found some of these to be helpful. Um, they're explained in an article that, that I wrote for the Journal of Hospital Medicine that, that Sheikah was nice enough to drive to be, be published very quickly after I wrote it. And, uh, and next slide, it's, it's shown here, it was published I think in the early part of May, this was the, uh, the, the cover of it. But it, this is what came out of the conversation between Elmira and me. So if you want some additional information on that last slide with the top 10 list of lessons from a soldier, uh, it's in this article and, and you can really get some additional information here. The last slide I'll show and then I'll stop talking and let 
my better half, Elmira speak, my, my work, work wife, Elmira speak. And that is what I've seen as a guy who's dealt in a lot of crises on the battlefield uh, thus far in our organization. The, the, the first bullet has to do with leaders stepping up with courage. And, and what I'll continue to say is what the course that we hold for our physicians, nurses, and administrators, truthfully, I mean, we have a five hour seminar every month for eight months. That's not a lot of time. That's a total of 40 hours. We get some work done, but I think the most important thing that comes out of that course is giving tidbits of leadership lessons to the attendees, but it also gives them the courage to step up. And Dr. Mansfield is a perfect example of that. Uh, she has turned into one of the leaders of our very large hospital system. And people are starting to listen to her just because she stepped forward. And I think when you're talking about women in medicine, uh, especially women in medicine, and what do I know, I'm a man, but I'm telling you, if, if women step up and they have the right answers and they have the expertise, they will be listened to. But there are some techniques for gaining that seat at the table. Um, our teams, from what I've seen, are accomplishing the impossible. In an organization that used to have a real split between doctors and administrators and a real uh, rift, a gap, between how they communicated. What I think a lot of people are seeing is uh, the leaders of the organization are really doing some things that were never thought possible in terms of changing the culture. The third bullet is, is taking that strategic vision that you have to get, as I talked about earlier, and translating it and transitioning into action. That's the critical piece. You not only have to, to develop and analyze your plan, you actually have to understand when you pull the trigger to make things happen. Um, the, the fourth bullet on there, we have heard more than anything uh, from our, our doctors who weren't part of the classes that the communication from both fellow physicians and the administrators has been the best it's ever been within our organization. And I think the crisis has driven that. And, and I know Myra is going to talk about that a little bit more, but, but that's the one thing that we have to hold on to to ensure that the expertise of the physician uh, is able to uh, step in and contribute to all the problem solving that our hospital system has. And then the final thing, I, I attended a session about a month ago with some of our physicians, and they gave a list of all the things that were innovations within that they were allowed to do. And it ran the gamut from, you know, how they were dealing with things in the emergency rooms all the way to uh, how they were using masks and, and using uh, uh, blood as part of a, a prophylaxis for, for future patients. I won't get into any of those things, but one of the most important things that I think is happening within our organization are people are taking notes and realizing they don't ever wanna go back to the way it used to be. Um, that's, that's the last thing that I'll say, and, and maybe Omira can add some additional things and then we can have a conversation. Thank you. Uh, I, a great way to start, I think, uh, and really set the stage for what, what we've all experienced. And the timing of this talk, I think we could not have planned better. And the reason I say that is when we had talked about doing this probably over a month ago, you know, we're in Florida, um, I'm still in Orlando, and we were starting to see our numbers start to go down and we were getting comfortable about reopening. And in fact, what we've seen in the last 10 days or so has been this dramatic ramp up. And so um, for a lot of us, um, at least in where we're, we're working, where I'm practicing, it, this, what we've learned and what we're talking about is even more timely now. Um, if we could go back to the slide that has the 10 tips, I just wanna to touch on a few of them um, because there is a lot of meat to each of these. And it, they may seem like short items, but they can be really meaningful if applied. So some of the background on this as Mark alluded to, one of the ways that we came together as an organization was to try to leverage the physician leaders that had, had been identified and trained through Mark's leadership development course. When you look around at who are the physici physician leaders within Advent Health, we all recognized each other as being graduates of the physician leadership course for the most part. It's only maybe a handful who haven't gone through the course. And the reason that's important is because probably one of the biggest takeaways that my colleagues and I will talk about from the course there were two things that being part of that development 
um, really does for a lot of us. First and foremost, it creates relationships and opportunities to sit in a very a private, almost intimate environment with administrators and have very candid, transparent conversations. And we have a rule in the leadership course that what we talk about in there doesn't leave that room. And at first you kind of think, is that really gonna happen? And then you, about three or four classes in, you actually start to realize that people are being very transparent and um, the humility that um, is presented. It's really incredible to see. And that's where the relationships that are built um, that, that really is, I think, is foundational. It's not just the content that we got from learning from Mark, but it was the relationships. As an emergency medicine physician, um, that is the backbone of my practice. If I don't have relationships with other people, then I can't successfully care for my patients because I need their help. That's one piece of it. But the other thing that we've all brought forward, and I think that this pandemic has helped us hone our skills, has been the ability to communicate effectively with people who are not physicians and you would think that we'd have that skill already, but we probably all know physicians who just don't know the language with which to speak to certain administrators or nursing colleagues. And it's about using the right dialogue to be effective at the table. And what I've seen over the course of the last several months are my colleagues who um, have, been gra have graduated with me from this development course. We've been able to bring that set of skills to the table and then really hone those skills over the last several weeks and months. And what I anticipate to see is that over the next few months as we face what we continue to face, that hopefully that's just gonna to continue to be the case. But going back to the top 10 tips for a crisis. So again, I'm an emergency medicine physician. While I'm a CMO, I still continue to practice emergency medicine. And that's really provided a perspective um, that I really appreciate because it's, there's one thing to be sitting in an office and feel immune to the stressors that our physicians are facing. And then there's that to go into the emergency department and feel the stress. I think when I reached out to Mark, it was around the time that I had worked a shift and had never experienced a shift in the ED like that in my life. I trained in a level one trauma center. I feel like I've seen a lot of the worst of what humanity can do to each other. But there was something about walking through that particular shift that day that I don't know if you recall or maybe some of us have chosen intentionally to forget what it felt like to work clinically in March. There was like a, a muck that you were walking through because the fear was so thick from my colleagues and the nursing staff and just everybody in the space because there was so much that was unknown that it was palpable. And a shift where I didn't see nearly as many patients as I normally would because patients weren't coming um, that, at that time to the ED, it felt like it dragged on for days. And I shared that with Mark and some of the rest of our team because that really uh, made me recognize the fact that we have to lead on so many fronts. And it's not just to share a message of how we're gonna get through this, but it's the ability to effectively share that message in a way that people could listen because the fear was so thick that I think it was hard for people to hear our story. And in doing so, um, I think we were also able to connect with our teams in another way, which was that emotional component, that human component that, again, we'll sometimes overlook when we're just thinking about how are we going to get through this day as a hospital system. Number one on this list of top 10 tips has really been the one that has resonated the most with me personally and then also with our team. You look at this and think, well, how much could you actually apply? What I did with this list once Mark had come up with it was I went to our leadership group at my hospital's. We have about 40 leaders, and these are going to be director and directors and above, um, and said, you know, this is not going to be easy. Um, having just worked in the ED, I can tell you firsthand, I know what it feels like and what our staff is feeling, and we need to be intentional about how we approach our conversations with our team. And step one is everybody's going to find a battle buddy. And, and I just really want to focus on that one because that's something that all of us um, who are dealing through this pandemic, whether you appreciate it or not, you probably need one. And Mark defined a battle buddy as being that person that, and Mark, you can jump in and correct me here if I'm wrong, um, but in the military is assigned to you, I believe in basic training, yeah, if you told me correctly, or if I remember correctly, um, basically someone who is gonna have your back. And in the healthcare environment, what we hope the battle buddy would be is, is someone who knows what you're in, um, sees what you're seeing, and also knows you well enough and you have the confidence in that if they see you getting to a point that you're just getting too close to the edge, whether that's your behavior, your, your tone, your words, 
that you need to be pulled back, that they're going to call you out. That's how I look at that person. Your battle buddy is a person who's going to have your back, watch out for you, and not just you in the clinical setting, but you as a human being. And similarly, you're accountable for them. And that accountability really raised um, the awareness at my campus, uh, not just within the physicians and our nursing staff, but all of our clinical leaders to say, we need to be mindful of how we're being, um, how we're being seen by our teams. One of the things that we talk about in the physician leadership course is that as leaders, we never have the opportunity, we're not allowed to have a bad day. Now, it doesn't mean you're not gonna have a bad day, but you can never let onto your team that you're having a bad day. And particularly during this pandemic, that was really critical. And the battle buddy is someone who can really um, help prevent that. I, I have my battle buddy. Um, and it was interesting to see my CEO um, identify their battle buddy and, and really throughout the line. And one of the ways that we actually would start our leadership meetings when the pandemic was really starting, starting to, to ramp up was asking people if they were willing to identify who's their battle buddy and why they chose them. That really cemented the idea. And what's fascinating is now is we're getting busier and busier. Um, we are, our numbers today are higher than they ever were in April. Those people are still relying on their battle buddies. It, it, Amara, if I can chime in, because it, it's been fascinating to me that uh, you talk about the, the effect that leaders have on their organization. It was probably within three days that Omar and I had this conversation about battle buddies. And I started hearing from all sorts of people about how they were choosing battle buddies because Dr. O'Meara said we were going to have, and you, and you forced it on people. I mean, it wasn't just a suggestion. You made people happen, right? Made yeah, happen. this was not an optional thing. Definitely not. No, for sure. And, and I think that's part of where, where we uh, play a role um, as leaders. And I know this is a women in medicine talk. So I really want to just for a moment pause and say that, so I'm, I'm a, one of two female CMOs in our um, division um, and the rest are all men. And um, sometimes people will say, well, you know, you got to be careful about how you touch on the emotional stuff because, you know, you're a woman and some people, I think that's too fluffy. And I vehemently disagree with that approach. Own it. As a woman, guess what? Congratulations. You're, you're, you may emotionally be in a better place to talk about these things and have more credibility to talk about these things than some of your colleagues. So own it and step it up. And that's really the position that I've taken. Um, and uh, as a result of that, I think it's also, it comes across so much more authentically because you can speak to it um, from that place. So I just want to mention that um, and not miss the opportunity to encourage women to embrace the opportunity to talk about things that some might label as fluffy, but quite candidly, they're critical to leading our team effectively in this particular mission. Yeah, and if I can add that too, if you go back to that slide I showed with the attributes, you know, there's that first block of character, that really defines who you are. The second block of presence is, is how you appear to others. And if you're really gonna be a great leader, you can't have a disconnect between who you are and how you appear. You shouldn't try and be anyone other than who you are. Uh, and the comment that Omira just said, there's a need for the kinds of things that women can bring to this fight. Uh, and, and there shouldn't be a hesitancy in stepping forward. Now, all leaders have to do it the right way. If you're trying to gain a seat at the table, you have to figure out what the best table manners are. But, but in every case, every individual brings a unique uh, characteristic and presence to every situation. One of the other things that Mark and I had talked about, um, and, and maybe not particularly, um, you, you won't necessarily get that immediately just from reading the tips off the slide. I would definitely encourage you to read the article because it really goes into a lot more of the meaning behind some of these. But we have to not just cherish our teams, which is one of the, se the second to last point, making these memory, making memories during these times are so critical. And Mark shared um, an experience um, just from the military about really in a situation that you could not imagine to be more dire, how do you walk away and have actually a pleasant memory from that? That almost seems incomprehensible. And that really stuck with me because I'm naturally, um, I think a positive person and it was really hard in some of these days to find anything to be positive about. There was one particular day, I remember it was a Wednesday and I was driving home from work 
and it was a bad day. And no, I did not let on to my team that it was a bad day. But as I'm driving home from work, I'm thinking to myself, this is really bad. Um, they had presented us with the latest statistics with what our predictions were going to be for patients. And it well exceeded by a multiple what we would have the capacity to care for, um, not just um, ICU patients or ventilated patients, but just all patients. And I, I started to feel that sense of despair that I had experienced um, while working clinically just on my drive home. And then I thought about what Mark had said about um, making memories. And I truly believe in not just, if you can't find the joy in the moment, find a way to create your own joy. And I thought to myself, I need to do something to, to flip the switch, to change the perspective, because this despair is just not, it's not healthy, it's not good, and, and really it's not gonna let me be an effective leader. And that particular day, I have two kids, um, they're five and two, and um, my husband was home already. And he's also, he's an anesthesiologist, so he was facing the same um, stressors at work that I was. And I walked in and I said, honey, um, I'm gonna jump in the pool. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to jump in the pool with all my clothes on. He's like, seriously, what are you, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I just, I, and I just, I need to do it. Um, because I knew the reaction that my kids would have, because this is not in my character whatsoever. So I did just that, um, took my kids outside and they thought we were just looking out at the playground and we got in the pool, clothes on. I did take my shoes and my, put my phone aside, just came. So if you're going to do this, let me just tell you, that's really important. Do that first. But what I loved about that moment in particular, my husband had the wherewithal to take a video of it. And when I looked back at it, and I've looked back at it several times when I've had some pretty bad days, is hearing the laughter um, that happened. And this was um, the second week of April. I'm and, not sure I and, and I will say that it has made such a difference in my life to have had that moment. That was a moment where we just we felt like we owned it as a family. And I've shared that story um, with as many people as I possibly can and the reason is, I think we have some more difficult days that are coming. Uh, I know here um, in Orlando, we're, we're seeing them literally day after day. And so we're still finding that, that intention in every day to, to create that joy and make those memories. And I think as leaders, we have to remind our teams that that's, that's just as important as the clinical work that we're doing. Mark, is there any, anything else you wanna cover in terms of the points? We have so many, it's so hard, and they're all, they're all so relevant and good. Uh, the, the, one, the one that I'll mention, uh, Omira, that I'm sure you've seen uh, was the one that says talking ain't fighting. Uh, I think what everyone knows is there are some individuals in the organization who talk a good game, uh, but perhaps don't deliver when it's time to deliver. And in a crisis situation, it becomes critically important to try and pull them in further even though they might not uh, be the most adept at bending a little bit to their normal approach. Uh, but it, it's just a requirement to try and figure out who talks versus who does. And uh, you can't keep loading up the people who always fight uh, using that term. Uh, you have to make sure everybody's sharing the load. And that's a requirement of leadership is to, is to make sure everybody on the team is contributing. Uh, the other thing I'll mention, Myra talked about the battle buddy, but it's related to that bullet that says fatigue on it. Uh, you know, in a crisis like this, as we've seen physicians across the country, you guys, I, I mean, first of all, I admire the hell out of everything you do, but I know you're all tired. This is Groundhog Day on steroids uh, when it's just, and you've seen that on the news reports and we've seen it in our hospital. Part of the responsibility of the battle buddy is to go up to that individual who is emotionally, physically, spiritually drained and say, get out of here. You, you, need, you need to take a rest day. You've got to break away from this. And I know that's hard to do and shift and all those things, but we've tried to incorporate that in our hospital where instead of elongating the shifts, we actually make shorter shifts and bring more people in to help uh, from other specialties. Elmira, you maybe you can talk about what you've done in terms of the teams on that one. Oh, that's, that's been critical, um, particularly identifying that depending on the setting that you're in, um, for example, we have cohort units. Uh, it is 
not just physically exhausting to be with patients that are COVID positive all day, it's emotionally exhausting to the team. And so expecting a, um, a nurse or a physician to work in a space for eight or 10 or 12 hours at a time, is just, it's not realistic. It, it doesn't lead to good patient care. And so knowing that up front, having practices, um, processes in place that would let you just have much more abbreviated sessions and use the team and rotate them frequently out um, those things that seem just so so simple, but because it's so out of practice, it's not common for us. You know, our most shifts are eight, ten, or twelve hours. Well, it doesn't mean you need to be doing the same thing all the time. And having that type of focus up front um, and dealing with it and explaining the why, I think that's been absolutely essential because we have had a few people who, um, at, for example, in the first few days of this, our lead infection prevention and infectious disease physicians. They were nonstop 24 seven and they were forced to take a few days off. Um, and that, I think that's critical for our leaders to, to know that they, they need to take responsibility for insisting on that rest. The other piece that um, is, is really critical and I think now is a great time for a lot of organizations to stop and do this if we haven't already. At the beginning of this, when this list went out, Mark also sent an email to all of the graduates of the leadership course and encourage them to journal their experiences. And we uh, actually prepared our leaders at my hospitals with an actual journal. We didn't, it didn't just say, we'd like you to journal. We gave them the journal and said, here is one of many coping me mechanisms that are out there, but we need you to lead in a certain way. And that's to jot down in real time, what are you seeing? What are you experiencing? What have we done well? What have we not done well? Because unlike other disasters that some of us may have been a part of, so being in Florida, hurricanes, um, being in mass casualty events, those are moments in time that then we can stop and recover and reflect. With this pandemic, there's no end date in sight. And so what can we do to make sure that we're learning and, and really documenting what our, our lessons have been? And we, we did that with our leaders and then just a few weeks ago took the time to bring them all together in a, in a socially distanced environment and have them share with us what their lessons learned were. And it was incredible to hear from everybody. And we're talking about from everybody from nutrition to respiratory to nursing uh, to materials management, pharmacy, rehab, anybody and everybody that's in a clinical environment that helps the hospital function to learn from them and the, none of us at the time that we did that debrief had any expectations that our numbers would skyrocket the way they have. And what a blessing because now we've actually implemented some of the lessons from them from just a few weeks ago and, and already applying. And now what we're doing is starting that cycle of journaling all over again and encouraging them to say, okay, now what? Now what are you, what are you seeing and what are you learning? That's been particularly useful and um, more critical than I would have thought. Yeah, if I can add to that too, Omar, I, one of the reasons um, that was a topic uh, that I asked the, the folks who, and we've had close to 600 people now go through the leadership course. So there's a pretty good network within our organization. And, and all of those leaders, as Omar said earlier, are the ones making a difference. But the journal piece is important because whenever you're in a crisis, after you get out of it, you forget how tough it was. And you forget all the masterful magic that you had that you caused to occur. So if you're writing those things down and you're saying, hey, we've got to establish processes to make those part of our implementations, you know, the individual pulls out the book and says, hey, this is what we did on this situation. We've, we need to make this a process or a systemic approach. And it, it happens. We are going to attempt uh, when you know, we thought it was going to happen in July, but because of the spike, we're going to have to delay it again. But we thought we would be able to pull all of the graduates of the physician leader course together after this was all over in a big ballroom and and basically do a, a major after action report on this uh, with different teams reporting on different things. You know what you do in terms of your lessons. Well, I guess the, the, the most effective way to say it is they're not lessons learned if you don't do them. They're only lessons. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to, to really focus on next. So this is absolutely spectacular, but I'm going to take us in. I know time is waning and I want to be able to get to some of these questions that are coming in in the Q&A. So 
First, I don't think it's a question, but I think that there is a petition going around already to get Dr. Mansfield on Twitter. <laughs> You're missing from the party, so I'm I mean, sorry. Hey, Lori, good luck with that. I've been trying to do that for a long time, and she won't do it. I actually am on Twitter, just so you know. It's just my, my name probably is not recognizable. Yeah. Okay. Well, come on in. The water's fine. Um, <laughs> no, I'm super curious. There have been a lot of positive comments about that amazing piece of advice uh, to make memories and what you shared. Mark, would you share anything? Is there anything that you could share from your background that would give just one more example for the audience to know how else that you can make a memory even when you don't feel like that's reality? I, I can, but I, when Omara brought that up and she said, I gave him an example. I don't know what example I gave him. That's the power of rehearsals. What are you talking about, Omara? The one about the World War II soldiers with the uh, potatoes. Wow, I'm still lost. There was a movie you're telling me about. It had something to do with, if I'm not mistaken, and if I get this wrong, I apologize. Okay. But um, there were soldiers that were, I believe they were prison prisoners of war that... Um, oh, 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 yeah. Okay, all right, I'm with you. Yeah, there, uh, there's a lot of my personal experience. That's what I was looking, I thought you wanted me to do. But the last time Omira and I talked and we were talking about actually making memories, I had just watched everyone's streaming movies now and I just watched one of my all favorite all-time favorite movies called The Great Escape with Steve McQueen and and there's a you know I mean this is a, a dire situation all these men are in a prisoner of war camp in Germany and but it's the 4th of July and two of the individuals they've been hiding the dirt from a tunnel they're I'm trying to make this as short as possible but they've been hiding the dirt from a tunnel they're making in gardens and they were growing potatoes and and the German guards couldn't understand why they were growing potatoes, so they had to find an excuse for it. And what they did is they built a still and they used the, the potatoes to make, you know, whiskey or mash or whatever it is that you make out of a still. And on the 4th of July, the, the British soldiers and the American soldiers, or the American soldiers had a ceremony where they had the, the guy with the pipe and drum and they walked through the camp and they were uh, singing Yankee Doodle and all the British soldiers came together having been their former former enemies and they made it a memory in the middle of this catastrophe where they just drank all this rot gut whiskey uh, on the 4th of July. If you can make something positive out of those kind of circumstances, you can find ways to give your teams memories in all kinds of dire situations. And and if I can just add, I, I see Amy Dave, Davis ask Omira a question, and it's the question I always get. And it's, you know, whenever I say you don't have the right to have a bad day, Omira brought it up. She said, you know, you can't have a bad day in front of other people. That doesn't mean you can't have a bad day or you can't go to your battle buddy and say, hey, I'm having a bad day or go home to your, your spouse and say that. But the issue is when you start having a bad day in front of your team, they start having a bad day. And that's what you want to try and avoid. So that's, it, it's sort of something that needs to be explained. Omar, you want to add to that too? No, I think it's perfect. I'm a big believer that, um, well, there's, there's two things. And again, being cognizant of what's the voice you want to be, what I, I call it, what's your brand? And my yeah. brand is one of um, positive energy and I demonstrate gratitude. And that's just who I am. Um, I'll give you an example. I've done during all of this, just at the request of our media team, a number of different um, media s spots. And there was one in particular that uh, was a request and um, they were like, well, they, they're kind of taking a more gloomy angle. And I just said, I'm sorry, that's, that's just not my brand. That's not who I am. And so I just I think you need to think about well, what is your brand? Because one bad day can actually ruin your brand. And it's almost like that one nail that you can take out that nail, but the mark is left. And so I try to just be really mindful that people will remember that. So you can have 10 great days after that, but just like I can have 10 great saves in the ED, chances are I might remember that one patient that was really tough. And that's why I just, it, it may seem kind of harsh to say that, but I just try to be cognizant of what do I want to be known for? And it doesn't want to be the person that might just have the bad day with that particular person. Yeah, the other thing, great. if I can give you an example, Lori, just that might be easier than making the potatoes <laughs> or jumping in the pool. It's just something that I'm really proud of what we did just along those lines. Um, 
we to try to encourage people to identify the positive to change the narrative because i think your perspective is so critical i saw again i'm an ed doc so it's really easy for me to think of the worst thing possible because that's what i have to do when i'm at work but if i carry that into my life it's pretty bad we put up um gratitude boards throughout the hospital we actually had them started in a one particular space that it was a private space for employees because one thing we heard collectively was we need a place that's off the unit where we can don't have to hear the word COVID one more time. Just the other day, two days ago, one of my ICU docs said, if I hear COVID one more time, I'm nauseous when I hear the word. So we've created this safe space for them just to get off the floor. But in that space, we put up gratitude boards and just ask the question, what are you grateful for? And put markers and people started marking these down. And now what we did was we displayed these boards all over the hospital. And despite the fact that we're all still facing a lot of stress, it's kind of neat to walk through my lobby, my front lobby, my ED lobby, the nursing lounge, the, the cafeteria, and there's these random gratitude boards that my colleagues all filled out. And that's something really simple that you can do at home and you can do at work. I'll close with one question and that is, what can we do better to develop our trainees and junior college colleagues to be better equipped to handle crisis when it presents in in the course of their career path based on what you know from from your recent experience and and from your training and background mark you want to start with that one uh, I, want right you, I want to hear what you say <laughs> okay fine um oh gosh there is so much i think i'm i'm i'm, I'm pausing because I think there is so much that we can do. But if I had to start with one thing first, it's model the behavior that you want others to display. Um, if you are a leader, um, one thing I would say is whether you have an official title or not, we're all leaders to someone. So again, own that and acknowledge that and realize that as a result of that, you carry influence and how you choose to use that influence is totally up to you. So be mindful of the behavior you're modeling, like not having a bad day maybe teach others this concept of what's their brand. Because I think if we start thinking in brand, a brand basically being an indication of what's our reputation, well, what would be the two words? There's one, one visual that I like to share with people. Imagine you're wearing a football jersey and you on the front of your jersey could pick a word that you think would describe you. Then ask your team members what word they would choose and see if the words add up. And if they don't, then where's the disconnect? And that's where I start to focus on who, what do I want to be known for? And I really hope that, you know, at the end of the day, people would go, hey, Omaira is someone who's going to give me a positive energy. She's going to be honest. She will have integrity and, and develop leaders with that mindset, because then they'll understand that they're always on stage and someone's always looking. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that um, we've tried to make it when, when all this leadership development thing started, it was an additional duty for me. I'll have to share that. I was doing some other things. I was recruited. Uh, by the organization to do something else. And the chief medical officer basically said, hey, you know a lot about leadership. We've been having trouble teaching physician leaders. Could you put a program together? The, the thing that is important, I think, about our program is it has specific objectives and it has an approach. And that sets the base for other things happening. Uh, you know, if, if a, a lot, I've read a lot of professional journals in healthcare, even though I'm not a physician. And it seems like every journal I read says, we need more doctors to lead. Well, yeah, you do, but that just doesn't happen. I mean, there, there's a requirement to help train people in that, and it's hard. Leadership is really, really hard. I know I've been studying it for 40 years and I still haven't figured it out. So the, the, the mentoring relationships, the teaching, the training, the, the, the helping other people be what you need them to be, um, that's all critically important. But I think just getting some tips on what contributes to making a good leader is really important. And then making sure, and this, this is the hard part, one of the things that the chief medical officer told me was, they, our hospital used to pick leaders based on their CV. And what I said as a former soldier was, well, that's kind of silly because a CV is only one part of who you are and it's not the best part. You gotta figure out who the good human beings are and why they do the things that they do. And that contributes to picking the, the real good leaders within healthcare. And then you gotta start helping them lead teams of doctors, nurses, administrators. This is hard stuff. 
and not too many organizations are getting it right so far from what I can tell. Well, we are out of time, but I want to first and foremost thank both Dr. Hurtling and Dr. Mansfield for this brilliant, brilliant talk. I do have to pass the mic in just a second to Shika because she has a few housekeeping items, but I do want to draw your attention to the poll item. Do you feel your institution organization has led through this pandemic well? While you're answering that, I am going to make a special request Dr. Hurtling, there was a question that was posed. Can you share some tips to prevent personnel burnout for leaders in this time of crisis? I'm going to suggest that we can't talk about that here, but would you mind hitting Twitter when we log off and posting sure. a couple of thoughts? And then everyone who's on, let's continue that conversation on social, please. Sure, absolutely. But thank you, thank you very much for your time and expertise. Dr. Jane, take it away. So what an amazing conversation and fireside chat. Thank you so much to Dr. Mansfield and to Dr. Mark Hurtling, um, non-medical doctor, but a doctor nonetheless, uh, for leading us through this amazing conversation on leading in a crisis, a fireside chat. Um, what you're seeing on your screen right now was done by the phenomenal uh, Dancing with Markers uh, expert. And um, Lauren will be uh, having this available to all attendees. We'll email this lovely um, uh, depiction of today's conversation out to all of you. You will also be receiving uh, information on how to claim your CME from the University of Illinois. Um, it is one CME credit that you can receive today. Uh, I would also like to remind everyone that because you registered for today's seminar, you will also be receiving a discount code for this year's Women in Medicine Summit. And both Mark and Omira are speaking at this year's summit. They're actually closing out day one and day two of this year's virtual Women in Medicine Summit. So if you liked what you heard today, and if you want to hear more from them, please uh, register for the summit. You can register at womeninmedicinesummit.org. Make sure you use your discount code. We also have nominations for awards and we have abstract uh, submissions open. So please make sure you do that as well. Thank you so much for sharing a part of your day with us today. I know most people are Zoomed out and virtualed out and it's exhausting to be on all of these uh, webinars and calls. So we very much appreciate you joining us and spending some time today with us. And we will see you again next month and we'll continue the conversation on social. So thank you again for joining us and have an excellent rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Good night.